The next talk is uh, given by Dr. Andreas Reisch, um, assistant professor in the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Strasbourg. He will talk about protein-sized and ultra-bright dye-loaded polymer nanoparticles for intracellular imaging. The previous talk by uh, Eltad Elnikavi, she's not, he's not here, so therefore mm -hmm. it's your turn. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I first would like to thank the organizers for for giving me the possibility to present you some of our works. So I will talk about, um, well, what's the size we use for um, fluorescent labels for intracellular labeling. And um, well, basically in our group, we're developing a lot of uh, fluorescent markers. And one of the directions are fluorescent markers for detecting and tr tracking single biomolecules in cells. And such kind of experiments give us quite a, a wealth of information to really look at how um, well, biomolecules interact directly in living cells and how this happens. And um, this means we have to label these, and um, this means at the same time that, well, our spatial and our temporal resolution we can achieve will depend very much on the brightness of the la label. And for example, the, the classical labels um, we use, like um, organic dyes, like fluorescent proteins, are simply not bright or at least not photostable enough. And so, well, this brings us the what do I have to, to um, fluorescent nanoparticles, which are able to overcome this limitation of brightness. And well, then what we need are fluorescent nanoparticles that should be um, well, very bright, that should be biocompatible, or at least non-interacting, and somehow small. But the question here is how small? And this question arises, especially if you think about what, what the cytosol looks like. And actually, this is a very crowded environment. So you have the cytoskeleton, you have high concentrations of proteins, of lipids. And um, so what's, what's the size we need here? Do we need, um, do we need sizes as small as single proteins? Are sizes like endosomes sufficient? And well, in order to look at this, we were interested to have a series of, of nanoparticles um, with different sizes and brightness high enough so we can do single particle tracking within the cell. And well, the kind of particles we're working on are so-called diluted polymer nanoparticles, so that's simply um, well, a non-fluorescent polymer particle in which we encapsulate in relatively large amounts of dye. And so the idea is, um, well, bright, oops, sorry, uh, brightness is actually the, um, the product of the absorbance of the, of the probe times its quantum yield. And in the case of these uh, diluted uh, nanoparticles, what we do is we encapsulate a high number of the fluorophores <coughs> in order to basically sum up or add up their, their absorbance. <coughs> but this also means we go to very high concentration within here. And this tends to lead to aggregation and self-quenching of the dyes. And in order to prevent this, in order to pre prevent a decrease of the quantum yield, we then use these um, hydrophobic bulky counterines as a sort of spacer to prevent aggregation. Well, the way we prepare these particles is through um, nanoprecipitation, where we simply combine then our dye salt with the polymer in an organic phase. We um, inject it quickly in an aqueous phase, and if you get the conditions right, we get our diluted nanoparticles. Well, how can we do size control for this? Well, um, we can work on the solvents, on the concentration of our components. We can use surfactants, but our approach generally is to or here is to use charges directly on the polymer. And um, well, we did this using different kinds of uh, charge groups, um, but uh, different concentration of charge groups here. I will mainly concentrate on these um, PMA-based uh, polymers bearing sulfonate groups. And indeed, if we use this and if we increase the amount of charges, we decrease the size and at about 5%, we're at, uh, or at 5% we reach particle size of about nine nanometers, so we're quite close to actually the size of single proteins. Um, if we increase the, the charge, uh, the percentage of charge groups further, we don't gain a lot here. And if we go all the way to 10%, we actually have already problems forming the particles. Well, that's very nice. We get small particles, but actually uh, the series is too small, but we can um, increase the size um, using salt in the precipitation medium, so just meditating, the, meditating the, the charge interactions. And with this, we can, again, increase the size. And at 30 millimolar of NSL, for example, we get these 32 nanometer particles. So that's the series we'll work with. But before injecting these, we'll have to make them fluorescent. So this we'll do by encapsulating about 10% of our 
dye salt, which gives, depending on the size, particles about three to 30 times brighter than um, quantum dots. And well, we have to somehow stabilize them for um, well, biological uh, environment. And uh, this we do simply by adsorption of um, a pegylated surfactant, so here twin. Um, and in this way, we get particles that are indeed stable in salt, but also against protein adsorption. And these particles we can then um, inject. And so, um, I just have to check. So if we do this with the 32 nanomotic, uh, nanometer particles, so we directly micro-inject them within the cytosol of the cells. And um, so here the video should be running. So what we see is actually that most of the particles remain um, close to the in, uh, injection point. And however, if we go to the case of um, the 17 nanometer particles, there we see that the particles actually spread out over basically the whole cytosol and um, <clears throat> move quite freely within the cytosol. We can also look at uh, maximum projection, so here over one minute, showing really here we get most of the particles really stuck close to the injection point, here spread out over basically the whole cytosol, um, indicating that we have some sort of uh, critical size for spreading throughout the cytosol. And if you look at our um, size distributions, this critical size seems to be around um, 23 nanometers. So now, this is the, the, critical, the first critical size we observe, but um, can we gain something more if we get slower, smaller? Not slower, but smaller. Um, and in order to look at this, we then uh, really try to directly compare two sizes of particles. And for this, we labeled two sizes of particles with different colors. So here um, was DID or a rhodamine derivative and co-microinjected them in the same cell. And um, well, if we do this with our 32 versus 17 nanometer particles, well, that's we already observed, so we see that actually we have this, um, uh, the bigger particles stuck around the injection point, the smaller particles spreading out. Um, we can look at the profile across the cells, that um, also represents this very nicely. But if we go now further to 17 versus 12 nanometer particles, there what we say is that, well, both basically spread over the cytosol, but we have here for the bigger particles some regions where actually um, the, the access seems to be limited to these uh, bigger particles, while the smaller particles can access. And if we go so further and compare 12 nanometer particles to 9 nanometer particles, what you observe is that, well, both actually spread quite well through the cytosol, but we have some regions, um, especially at the edges of spread out cells, where there we seem to have a better access for the, still for the smaller particles. And um, so with this, uh, already like to conclude that we indeed using this approach with this uh, charge controlled uh, nanoprecipitation we can obtain such protein sized well, diluted nanoparticles um, we can vary the size quite a lot from less than 10 to about 50 nanometers using the, the same systems and we still get a very high brightness especially compared to quantum dots and well this allowed us to really observe this critical particle size of about 23 nanometers that we have to to reach or to um, below in order to have a nice diffusion spreading throughout the cytosol. Um, so with this, I would like to thank the, the people involved in this work. So Pauline, who did the, uh, the polymer synthesis, um, and, um, Dorian, who did the, um, the particles, Anne, who did also part of the particle um, preparation. Um, well, you've seen, uh, we want some more information. Nina, who has a poster on a bit more our work and nanomedicine in Strasbourg and, um, well, also our funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> Mr. Reich, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Thanks very much. It's just, I'm intrigued, uh, not exclusively by cytosol distribution of those size demand particles. So mm -hmm. what, is, what is the nuclear entry cutoff? Um, in so your opinion, because I, I, I tell you, so I, I did work in this area, so just I'm, I'm interested in your opinion. So what, what did you, what did you observe? Um, that we don't go far enough down with these particles to reach, uh, to get really into the nucleus. We have now other particles that um, mm -hmm. go around the pack shell, so that yeah. we, we don't need the pack shell, and there we're really about, about, about seven nanometers with mm -hmm. the smaller ones. And there it starts to have, I think, some entry. But this is a really rather preliminary results for this. 
Yeah, but yeah. we we need to be a little bit smaller still than than this, these ones here. Because I mean, using such a system is going to be really exciting to to get that nuclear entry cut off. Because the, it's it's sometimes somewhat it, it's still a paradoxical issue, you know. And you you can get the particle of seven nanometer, and it won't get into the nucleus. But it doesn't necessarily mean the nuclear pore size is is below seven. It could be just it could be aggregates of five by by seven. It gets thirty five and it's cut off. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm just uh, it's extremely important to get this. I, I do agree, but I think the problem is that um, and where there's not so much known about this, um, you have to, to take into account really what, what happens to the particles within the cytosol already. Yeah, yeah. Um, so because it's, it's maybe not really, um, this, no, it's not a, the same um, environment than we have um, extracellular. Yeah. And um, I think there is still some work also to be done to control what, what happens to the particles even on the surface and, right, and with yeah. the surface chemistry. But um, yeah, I think the the important thing is really to go down to this um, to very small size, so also to take care of uh, the fact if you use, for example, PEG, that even with the PEG shells, your yeah, nanoparticles yeah. don't go above this um, probably seven nanometers um, of yeah, size. Yeah. Need, yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Question here. So it was really nice, a nice approach. Uh, the one thing that I don't understand, why did you add twin? Because twin is always toxic and you don't want to have it. And is it absolutely necessary to put it on the surface or you can um, work without so it? So for, for, for working with this series of particles, yes. Um, uh, toxicity for this series of particles also is not really an issue because the, the time scale of the experiments is, um, well, actually the real time scale I'll show here is uh, basically rather at the level of two minutes. After post-injection, we do this um, the imaging, but we have to um, the we have to really cover properly the surface. Otherwise, that's a bit of uh, the question we uh, the, the this context. Otherwise, we'll uh, we see that we very quickly get um, stuck, get the particles stuck. So probably some adsorption on whatever intracellular um, well. Uh, intracellular compartments, uh, interactions with the proteins. Mm -hmm. So we need to really protect the surface when we want to just look at the, si at the size. But don't you think that twin may interact, so they absorb from the particles and go somewhere else in the cell and uh, interact over there with something and cause some false results in the end in your experiments or you think it's mm. not important? Um, well, uh, Let's say the, the next generation, we don't need to twin anymore. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, I didn't, uh, cannot include this here for the moment, but um, uh, in this case, we basically observe the ge same general results. Mm -hmm. And uh, the twin concentrations we can use are relatively low, and we actually often then um, can even dialyze. Mm -hmm. um, so we add our twin and we dialyze, and we still have the same effect. But if we don't add the twin, uh, the twin itself, then we, we see that the particles slow down. And so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So, one other question, since we, we do have a little bit of time, so therefore <laughs> the question is possible. You showed that if you increase the charge density on the particles, that then they become smaller. I would expect the opposite, because if you have more charge, the particles become more hydrophilic, they swell probably a little bit. So what's your explanation for this observation? Well, that's actually, um, so the, we don't necessarily increase the charge density on the um, on the particles, but on the polymer. And um, um, the reason for this is that uh, the, the process we use, this nanoprecipitation, is a kinetically controlled process. Mm -hmm. And actually, by, by adding charges on the polymer, we, um, we interfere in a certain sense with the kinetics of the formation. So we, we enhance somehow nucleation, um, we slow down the growth, and we well, avoid very strongly aggregation. And so this all goes into the direction of, of smaller particles. But um, in the end, what, what seems to come out for, for these particles is that, um, well, uh, particles, so if you look at, at how many charges you have in the end per particle, you see that for these small particles, the, the whole number of charges per particle is basically constant. Um, and so we suppose that there you have some limit where actually um, if you have a certain number of charges, we do this in very low, um, most of the, thing, uh, of the small particles we do in very low salt, um, or basically millihue water. And so there um, the, the Debye length is uh, long enough that it actually covers the whole particle and, uh, and beyond. So we see, really seeing that it's um, uh, the limit of how many, of how to say, um, 
if you have a, a particle having a certain number of charges, you need to bring in a polymer to make it further grow that also is charged. And if you have a certain number of charges, it will just repel the, the incoming chain. So that's, uh, that's interfering with the kinetics rather than with the surface it, itself. Okay, thanks. So thank you very much again.